Today I want to begin our time by talking about another former Archbishop of Canterbury who was Archbishop of Canterbury about a thousand years ago, and his name is Anselm. And he is the saint whom we will be celebrating at our celebration of new ministry on April 20th. His feast day is April 21st. Because it's the evening, it's appropriate for us to celebrate his feast day because it's like Christmas Eve. It's like Anselm's Day Eve. And I didn't feel like it was appropriate for us to celebrate 420 the way 420 is celebrated in Humboldt County. It's not quite quite ready for that yet. But uh, Anselm's Day. I'm excited about Anselm. Um, So I want to say a little bit about him. He is known as the father of scholasticism, which is a certain approach to studying theology and philosophy. I also say he's the father of satisfaction, and that's a theory of atonement. And this is going to bleed into our conversation on John 10. So let me first say something about Anselm. He was born in Aosta in 1033 in what is now Italy. I think at the time it was part of uh, Burgundy. And he was uh, right at the foot of the beautiful Alps. And he had a somewhat troubled childhood. His uh, mother was deeply Christian and pious, and he had a close relationship with his mother. His father was violent and abusive and um, uh, probably an alcoholic and did not want anything really to do with the church, did not want his son to have anything to do with the church. His mother um, taught him most of what he knew about God as a child, and his mom said that God lives uh, on high. And in Anselm's young mind, he always thought that meant God lived up in the mountains, up in the Alps. And so he had this really profound dream when he was about seven years old of actually visiting God up on the mountaintop. And his mother then died, and he did not remain living with his father. Um, He just knew that wasn't going to work out well for him in the long run. So he actually sort of wandered around Western Europe, what was the Holy Roman Empire at the time, basically modern-day Germany and France, uh, for several years, and then eventually moved into the Abbey of Notre Dame of Beck in Normandy, and he became a Benedictine monk. And he studied under this great teacher, one of the smartest uh, teachers at the time, Lanfranc, who was uh, the abbot of Beck when Anselm arrived. And Anselm quickly became one of Lanfranc's favorite pupils. And when Lanfranc left the abbey, Anselm uh, was voted to be the abbot. And then Lanfranc became the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1070. And then when when Lanfranc died in 1093, Anselm replaced him as the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he's this very cosmopolitan figure. He's born in northern Italy, so within the orbit of Rome. He then goes to France where he is a Benedictine monk, and then he ends up going to England, to Canterbury. I was thinking it would be fun. Ashley and I were thinking about doing like an Anselm pilgrimage. Ashley loves spending time in Italy, and we've been to France, to sort of an Italy, France, England pilgrimage. So he's the father of scholasticism. And a phrase associated with Anselm, as well as Augustine, but Augustine was about 500 years earlier, but Anselm really... Uh, really claimed it and took off with it and used it for scholastic method. That's the phrase faith seeking understanding, fides quarens intellectum. I think I have the Latin in your handout. It's this idea that we learn about God by first believing in God. So it's not first give me all the answers to my questions and then I will believe. It's this idea that we will not be able to understand unless we first take the sleep of faith. Soren Kierkegaard, a philosopher, existential, existentialist, would have said something similar. He says it's important to know through experience, through taking a leap of faith. This is sort of a, a proto-Kierkegaardian uh, approach to knowledge. We take a leap of faith, and then we understand. It's 
an active love of God, seeking a deeper knowledge of God. So in order to grow an understanding of God, one must first have faith in God. So Anselm thinks that we first need to take a leap of faith before we can really understand. But then once he takes the leap of faith, he really does want to understand. And he wants to actually prove the existence of God. And Anselm is the first one to try to come up with an argument that proves God's existence. And it's called the ontological argument. And he writes about this in the Prologion. You guys heard of this? The ontological argument? Philosophers ever since him have had to engage with this argument. It's based on a very Platonic way of thinking. The great chain of being, as Doug was telling me about. It's based on the great chain of being and this idea of the world of ideas being more real than our current world. Our current world is sort of, the world we're in now is the world of shadows and all sort of shadows in comparison to the, the, the idealist realm. So let me briefly go through this ontological argument just because I think it's kind of fun to be introduced to it. So what is God? He first comes up with a definition for God. And he's saying that God is really the best thing. Whenever we think of God, if we all went around, I think we might all agree that God is really the ultimate authority, the ultimate power, the very best thing we could ever imagine. Right? I think we would all agree that that's part of our definition of who God is, the best thing we can imagine. He says, yes, that's, that's what God is, but he then specifies by saying, God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. It's a famous Anselmian phrase, God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. And it doesn't sound all that great in the English, because it's right in Latin, but we can't think of anything greater than God. That's part of the definition of God. All right, so now think of an apple. You guys have an apple in your mind? Think of like a nice, perfect apple. Now, what is better than the thought of an apple? Wow. <laughs> apple pie. <laughs> what is better than the thought of an apple is an actual apple. Which, which would you rather have? If, you're, if you really want an apple, would you rather have a thought of an apple or an actual apple? Right. So his point is that something that exists is always greater than the idea of something. So you can have a perfect cheeseburger in your mind, but you'd rather have that cheeseburger that actually exists. So he says, if God is a being than which nothing greater that can be conceived, then God must exist. <laughs> you see what he just did there? Okay, so... If God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, then if I, so I have this idea of God, it's the most perfect being in the world, but if nothing greater can be conceived of God, then God must exist because the greater thing would be a God that actually exists. You could have a perfect island in the Pacific Ocean in your mind, but it'd be better if that island actually existed. And so if nothing greater can be conceived, if God is nothing than which anything greater can be conceived, then God must have this quality of existence. It's not perfect, but yet it's also quite compelling, and philosophers have had to deal with it ever since. Okay. I want you to be aware of that because St. Anselm is who we will be celebrating on April 20th. 